In our last session, we talked about four fundamental concepts of model-based systems engineering. Taking a systems view, beginning high, recognizing the existence of three systems and four domains in every design project, and the role of systems engineering across the entire system's life cycle. This time, we turn to the MBSE process itself. It should come as no surprise that systems engineering is carried into being through a process. Just as having no theology is a theology in itself, having no thought out process is a process of sorts. It's simply a process that is beyond the control of the engineer using it. Stuff just happens, and as a result, it happens to the designer rather than because the designer wants it to. Good systems engineering is the product of a sound, well thought out process. As the discipline has matured, the process has been refined to make it more effective and to leverage new tools and methods. But from the outset, there has been a process underneath the design, and the best systems engineers have been very intentional about defining and following it. From the beginning, the systems engineering process recognized that there is work to be done in all four of the systems engineering domains. Requirements, behavior, implementation structure, and validation and verification. Initially, the process called for work to be undertaken and completed one domain at a time. This was the traditional process insofar as it makes any sense at all to talk about a tradition and a discipline as new as systems engineering. This traditional process came to be referred to as the waterfall approach. Its name came from the fact that water travels along a set of falls without reversing its course or revisiting any of them. Once past a fall, the water is done with that part of its course and would not return. The design was seen as following a similar path. Once done with the requirements work, it moved on to the domain of behavior and, when finished there, to the physical architecture. The reasoning behind the waterfall approach is fundamentally sound. The system produces behavior that will satisfy the requirements. It follows that we can only know so much about behavior until we have a relatively robust understanding of the requirements. It makes sense, therefore, to develop the requirements first before defining the system behavior. The same is true for the development of the physical implementation of the solution. The behavior is allocated to the physical components and must precede their development. Even given the concerns that have led to the later modifications in the systems engineering process, it makes sense to discuss and teach systems engineering in the framework of the rational logic behind the waterfall method. We will do that in later sessions, but not because we are advocating the waterfall approach. It simply gives us a logical context for considering the subjects of the domains. Eventually, it became clear that the central weakness of the waterfall approach was that the design process was, in reality, iterative. Efforts like rapid spiral development grappled with this reality. In the end, they all pointed to the futility of thinking that designs could proceed domain by domain without revisiting the work to account for learnings gathered in subsequent domains. Another limitation imposed by the waterfall approach was the division of the design into the respective domains. This promoted a view of the design that saw the domains as actually separate. Work on a given domain was assigned to separate teams, specialties developed in the domains, and separate tools were developed. All of this acted to drive apart the work and the thinking and to create stovepipes with their attendant communications problems. Adding to the segmentation problem is the fact that the typical systems engineering process has also been document-centric. 
There are those who still argue that the model and model-based systems engineering is contained in the documents. By document, we mean both pictorial or diagrammic, diagrammatic artifacts as well as the textual ones. It still is not uncommon for a systems engineering team to point to a mound of documents as the design or the model. Today's practice is in transition away from document centricity to a truly model-based design. Documents by their very nature segment and divide the various aspects of the design. The result is a segmented view of the system being designed, which results in distorting the design and denying the designers access to the full nature of the system. In effect, any segmentation acts to blind the viewer by obscuring the essential qualities of the system. An integrated model imposes no such limitation and, in fact, provides the needed insight into the solution. From this emerged a different approach. It recognizes the problems of a fragmented system view and addresses them through planned integration and iteration. This approach begins with an understanding of the problem. As Professor Acoff points out, the failure to understand the problem is a common and a quick path to failure. Albert Einstein said, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about the solutions. The understanding of the problem to be solved is absolutely critical to the solution-seeking process. It is, therefore, the first step in our process. Another threshold question is that of the solution boundary. This is controlled by the nature of the problem to be solved. Ignoring or failing to define it can lead quickly to solving the wrong problem or to a solution that presumes too much in terms of how it will work. We need to know if we are being asked to design a railroad, a train, or just the trucks or wheels. If our problem involves the design of the railroad, then the boundary encompasses the trackage and the rolling stock, as well as the support and logistical facilities like stations, maintenance, and supply depots. If our commission, on the other hand, is to design a train, then we are not free to redesign the tracks or the stations. The boundary is the train out to its interfaces with the rail system. Again, if we are designing the trucks or wheel sets that roll the trains across the tracks, we're not free to design the tracks or the rail cars and engines that our trucks will carry. The boundary defines the limits of our authority to design. The boundary sets our interfaces with the world outside it. We design to the interfaces, but not outside them. This can become a critical distinction. I went off to my freshman year of college with a slide rule. At Christmas of that year, Hewlett Packard introduced a brand new electronic calculator. Small enough to be held in one hand, it could subtract, add, subtract, multiply, and divide, take percentages, and not much else. Many of my friends with technical majors returned to school from Christmas with a brand new calculator. These were immensely popular until the following summer. That summer, Texas Instruments introduced its version of the same basic calculator. Their calculator immediately gobbled up a major share of the market. The reason? The Hewlett Power Packard calculator used reverse Polish notation for problem entry into their calculator, while the Texas Instruments design allowed the user to enter the problem in the same way they would write it on the sheet of paper to solve it manually. Hewlett Packard had made a fatal mistake. Arguably, reverse Polish notation was a superior way to handle problem entry. But in imposing it on their customers, Hewlett Packard crossed their design boundary and tried to redesign the customer's approach to problem solving. 
The loss of market share was a clear message to HP that they were not free to redesign the customer side of the interface. Hewlett Packard had failed to accurately assess the boundary. With the boundary lines accurately defined and the problem adequately understood, we are ready to proceed to the problem solving process. Rather than a domain by domain approach, we are going to take a look at a layered process. We will begin at a high level of abstraction where the system to be designed can be represented by a gray box with inputs and outputs. From that level, we will begin to decrease the levels of abstraction by increasing the granularity of the system description. At every level, we will work in all four of the domains, requirements, behavior, physical architecture, and verification and validation. We will complete each level to a given granularity before moving on to the next one. This differs from the waterfall type process in that it integrates all four domains in each level rather than advancing from one completed domain to another. Instead of attempting to complete all of the work on requirements before moving to the definition of the behavior, requirements, behavior, and implementation are all integrated into the level of granularity at the current stage of the design. The process moves back and forth across the domains within the given level, making advances and adjustments until that level is complete. This means that the inner domain considerations are accounted for in each level and the necessity to rework parts of a domain and to trace the effects of the rework into others is eliminated or greatly reduced. It's not necessary to start over with a piece of the design as design choices are made as the levels are advanced. There is no need to revisit the choices at a later stage. By linking to the domains together in this way, it's easier to incorporate changing requirements. Their impact is readily apparent, and they can become a part of the design without extensive searching and rework. All in all, the design advances in a logical and disciplined way, producing a complete design at every level. The design team has control over design choices which are made intentionally and with the full information about the design. The advance of the model through the levels can be thought of in terms of the purposes that are served by the model at given levels. The very highest level abstractions seek to shed light on the context and concept of the design. At this level, the model offers insight into the role and place of the design in its environment. Decisions as to the nature of the problem being solved and the boundary conditions of the solution can be considered. From there, the design moves into an analytic stage where the decisions as to the direction and course of the design development are the main questions. The design begins to take shape and choices and trade-offs are shaped. As the design moves out of the analytic phase, it enters the stage where the concrete design choices are made and the details of the design emerge in full focus. All of this is made possible by the decreasing abstraction and increasing granularity of the progressive levels of the design. Like a focus ring on a camera lens, the levels bring indistinct shapes into greater and greater definition. The destination is a model that fully embodies an actionable system specification. The layered process achieves this goal with a progression that offers intentionality and control to the design team at every juncture along the way. In this session, we have begun our look at the MBSC process. We will continue that, but next time, we will pause to introduce a sample problem to use in our consideration for the remainder of this series. Until then, be well.